Maps. But uh, I, can, I can tell you, uh, Neil was telling me that he knew of my career for at least 20 years, and I said, since when? Since the Ibogaine story came out. And actually, most people who followed the Ibogaine story, uh, and Howard Watsoff, and uh, especially how he got uh, us at the University of Miami interested in doing some phase one studies, that's when I, I guess, became known to some people interested in the science of psychedelic uh, research, uh, psychedelic action. Uh, but actually my career uh, started uh, actually in 71 when I went back to university after leaving an art career and uh, went to Bob Schuster uh, who was the, had started a uh, drug dependence research lab at the University of Chicago. But I went back to Chicago because they had been doing LSD research. Danny X. Friedman was the chairman of psychiatry. And uh, unfortunately I came at a time when those studies were ended. So I was persuaded by Bob Schuster uh, to focus on mechanisms of opiate dependence, which was another very fascinating study. He later went on to become head of National Institute of Drug Abuse, and as you heard earlier, he's the one that introduced um, Bob Jesse to Roland Griffiths. So I have that pedigree of being connected with these uh, key people. Bob Schuster was the god my godfather. He's the one that told me that ideas are a dime a dozen, because every day I had 12 ideas. Uh, but I should focus and carry them out. And I'm bringing this up because there's some young people who wonder, how do you make a career in psychedelic research? Well, I did not make my career in psychedelic research. In fact, the first thing that Bob Schuster told me, I was very honest with him, I said, I want to study how visions occur when one takes LSD. He laughed and he said, well, first of all, that you can't study that. Secondly, don't ever admit publicly that you've taken any illicit substance. So. There I go. That, so my fantasy way back then was to find some kind of medical application for this class of, of substances. And uh, for years I've been looking for the right graduate students to, to help me with this work. And fortunately, uh, Brian Catlow, a, a very brilliant uh, young woman from New Zealand, was doing her PhD in the neurosciences. And uh, I had been doing a lot of work on neurogenesis, the birth of uh, neurons in the uh, uh, adult brain in the hippocampus. And that's what I'm going to focus on. She began to learn how to measure uh, neurogenesis, and we, we realized that this would be an interesting project because we knew that serotonin uh, agonist, the 5H2A agonist, and increasing levels of serotonin produced by serotonin uptake inhibitors, like the antidepressants, resulted in increased neurogenesis. And that the delay in recovery from depression correlated with the time to develop new neurons. Mm -hmm. So it took two to three weeks, and that's how long a newborn neuron in the hippocampus takes to mature and start integrating in this hippocampal circuitry. Um, so she did that as part of her PhD project. So we've not published any of this. You're hearing it right hot off the press, off of her thesis. She unfortunately is in New Zealand, otherwise she would have presented it. She would have done a beautiful job. And uh, so, so, You've heard all, you all know this, but I, I it's a good introductory slide. Uh, uh, psilocybin certainly is well known to induce uh, mystical and uh, spiritual experiences. Uh, you know what that is already. Um, by virtue of providing these novel perspectives, I, I feel that psilocybin enhances uh, the process of understanding and creative thinking and problem solving. And that's what impacted me a lot. I, not only this, um, sense of oneness and uh, kind of uh, transcendental experience, but the fact is that one later could 
use this to solve problems. And I saw it, like many have, as a kind of a chemical lens that allow you to see things in a different dimension, just like a microscope allows you to see these invisible things in a, in a, in a bit of water. You can see all the microbes, right? Well, this would allow you to see things that normally you wouldn't see. So that's kind of been um, my perspective on this. And so, but to do research on this, you have to ask very simple questions. Now, science is often reductionistic. You have to narrow it down to a few simple questions. So, so I don't know how to understand the, the transcendental effects of psilocybin, um, especially how is it generated in neural tissues. You heard attempts this morning by using uh, in vivo PET imaging uh, to try to understand what neural networks are activated by looking at oxygen uh, at glucose consumption. It's a very crude approximation, but at least it's done in humans who are actually experiencing these transcendental uh, effects. Um, however, some very simple forms of cognition can be studied in animals. And, and one of the basic units of learning is, is classic conditioning. and Everyone is familiar with that through Pavlov's dog. Um, it's very easy to pair a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, and that neutral stimulus soon elicits the same response as the unconditioned stimulus. So you've seen your dogs, as soon as they hear you opening the can, they're drooling. You know. So that's classical conditioning. Um, so our goal was to focus on the effects of psilocybin, which we knew, um, we, we, we didn't know, but we hypothesized increased neurogenesis by virtue of its acting on 5-H2A receptors. And we were going to correlate the changes in neurogenesis to hippocampal dependent learning in a mouse. Next. Um, I don't need to go into this, but uh, we, we obtained the psilocybin from, um, from Rick Doblin, who, who connected us with Dr. Moreno in New Mexico. We were able to get it to the University of South Florida. No, it was not that difficult to actually have this uh, material for the mice in this study. And as you know, it's, it's really... Uh, the, uh, converted to the active metabolite for hydroxyl dimethyltryptamine or psilocin. Next slide. Um, so the question was, how does this impact the neural substrate of classical conditioning? And the neural substrate of classical conditioning is really two, two systems. One is the hippocampus, the other is the cerebellum. And I'll just briefly tell you, for many of you who don't know this, but the eye blink conditioning, where you have a neutral tone and then a puff of air, and then the blink, and after a while, the neutral tone will cause the, bl bl uh, the blink even before the puff of air. That cannot be learned. It's very impaired in individuals, I'll say first animals, but then later confirmed in humans, who have their neurogenesis impaired by a chemotherapy, for example. Uh, in rats, if you completely obliterate neurogenesis with chemotherapeutic agents, they cannot learn this classical eye blink conditioning. However, if you present the tone superimposed with the puff of air, they will learn that, and that depends on cerebellar systems. So one is called trace conditioning, the other is just uh, um, classical conditioning. So it's not just hippocampus, it's also cerebellar dependent. So we're, uh, next slide. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this, you've all heard about this. The only thing that's new uh, is the 25INBOME, which is this 25 iodo and 2 methoxy benzyl 25 dimethoxy phenylethylamine that was synthesized by Dave Nichols. And I asked him if he could provide us with the most selective and potent 5 H2A agonist because psilocybin itself doesn't bind exclusively to 5 H2A. But you can see the 5 H2A receptor, the binding of psilocybin to it, is, has a Ki of 6 nanomolar. Uh, so it's a pretty high affinity. But this other compound, the NBOE, NBOME is 150 times more potent uh, in binding. So, so we looked at this too because it was a more selective uh, serotonin agonist. Next slide. So just to, I'm going to talk a bit about the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus uh, uh, is an amazing <coughs> structure. Um, it's called seahorse because of its resemblance to the seahorse. This is a human hippocampus. You can see this part here. Hippocampus, and the very cap of it is the amygdala. Next slide. And in the mouse, though, it's very different. In the human, it's kind of curled under the temporal lobes. In the mouse, it's up dorsal, and there I have it circled. It's just under the corpus callosum, and it's got a beautiful little curve.
curve to it. And this part of it, it's called the dentate gyrus, DG. That is an important structure for you to look at because that's where neurogenesis is. The subgranular zone is uh, the neurogenic niche. In that zone, neural stem cells reside. And throughout adult life, new neurons are formed. Next slide. Uh, this is what happens. As they form, in the, this is the dentate gyrus, they form here, and they, they, move, they, they extend their processes to the granular layer and thence on to uh, other regions of the brain. Uh, next slide. So the other area that is very important in mice and rodents is the subventricular zone. The subventricular zone makes new neurons throughout life, and they migrate through the rostral migratory stream to the olfactory bulb to form new neurons. And men and humans, this happens too, but we don't have, uh, we don't have a great extent, uh, very much neurogenesis that involves this system. We're all into the hippocampus. And by the way, this was uh, proven in humans only in a terminal cancer patient who agreed to be injected with the tracer BRDU. BRDU is a base like thymidine that is taken up by dividing cells. And it was used in, uh, to, to label the mitotic index, to calculate mitotic index, the rate of proliferation of a tumor cell. And this cancer patient agreed to have it, the BRDU injected for several, week, several weeks, and then after that person died, um, agreed to have his brain looked at. It wasn't our lab, it was a group in Sweden. And they found the BRDU in neurons, in this area. So it demonstrated that new neurons continue to form uh, throughout life. And, and this is uh, the dentate gyrus. This is a, a brand new stem cell. Next slide. They, uh, oh, you can't see the projection, but they project axons to the anterior commissure to go to the other side. They project up to CA1. CA1 stands for cornus aminus, or Ammon's horn, because of the curve. And these project back by the enter, enterino cortex back to enteronal cortex. So this is just part of a loop. And what we believe that this system is involved in, because the question is, why do we make new neurons only to, to repopulate this region only? These neurons don't populate the rest of the brain. It's many people, there's a strong hypothesis uh, with good data that this neurogenesis is critical for temporal encoding of episodic memories. So, uh, and the reason that happens, and that it kind of explains why if you wipe out this system, people cannot link that tem temporal link between the conditioned stimulus, the pause of time, and then the little unconditioned stimulus. They can't do it if you don't have neuron. So I, I postulated, if we can increase neurogenesis, will we enhance the acquisition? Or will we alter the, another uh, important measure of classical <coughs> conditioning is the extinction of the link, which, you, as you'll see, is actually the critical factor um, that we can, uh, well, we'll go on, I'm jumping the gun. Uh, go, we'll skip this, we'll skip this, keep on going. Okay, so here's some old data from a, a group, I thought, I uh, can't, can't see who it was, but, but basically serotonin itself is involved in the regulation of neurogenesis. This has been known for some time, and initially, uh, if you look at the y-axis here, total BRDU labeled cells per dentate gyrus, and this is a very time-consuming method, histological method, and you can see under control there's about 2,100, 2,200 new neurons formed under baseline conditions. Um, uh, at any time, you see those new neurons. Um, after electroconvulsive therapy for intractable, that's usually used for intractable depression, but this is in animals, you see a tremendous increase in the number of total newborn neurons. But fluoxetine also did something very much the same. So uh, not as ex extensive as ECS, but uh, uh, there were new neurons being formed with high synaptic levels of serotonin. Next slide. And how does it increase? Oops. There are many subtypes of uh, 5-H2 receptor. Let's go to the next. So we, we focus on the 5-H2A, uh, and we used these two. Psilocybin, PSOP is psilocybin from now on. It's, it's too long to write psilocin. So this is psilocin, psilocybin, and the agonist provided by Dave Nichols. And we also looked at an antagonist to see what impact blocking the, the serotonin receptor. It's a 5-2A slash C receptor 
that antagonizes, occupies the receptor, and would block the actions of serotonin, or 